right, so uh, I guess thanks everyone for, for coming out this morning. Um, so I'm going to be giving a, an introduction, uh, essentially a very brief uh, introduction to epigenomics. Obviously, there's a lot to unpack there. Then I'm going to spend time talking about uh, chip sequencing. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the underlying technology, which is obviously massively parallel sequencing, which has really driven the field of epigenomics, as I think everyone in this room probably knows. In fact, that's how I got uh, into this field back in 2007, uh, was uh, you know, some of the first experiments that we ever ran on the Selexa platform at the time uh, were ChIP-seq experiments. Uh, and uh, so I'll be talking, um, talking about how uh, the FASTQ files are generated, which is, of course, the, the, the commodity uh, of, of ChIP-seq sequencing, uh, as well as whole genome bisulfide sequencing. Um, so I think you've seen this already. Uh, this is my introductory slide. Uh, as I mentioned, I mean, I, I've really been in this field uh, for about a decade now, um, uh, and the, the view I'm showing you here is uh, from the Roadmap Epigenomics Consortium, and I'll be talking about some of the data that we've generated through that. And in fact, the lab practical uh, is uh, based on data uh, generated as part of the, the roadmap. So the learning objectives for the module uh, this morning are really um, seem a bit redundant given uh, everyone's uh, experience here, uh, but we're going to be talking a little bit about the, um, uh, some epigenomic principles, uh, and then I'm going to go into the basic molecular biology uh, driving Illumina uh, next generation sequencing. Uh, so we'll talk about how we generate the clusters and uh, how we uh, generate the paradigm reads, uh, which will then uh, flow into uh, how these are then converted to FASTQ files. Um, uh, and I'm a big proponent for understanding the data that you're, de that you're dealing with uh, when moving into the bioinformatics. Then I'll talk about some of the underlying principles and challenges of chip sequencing, uh, and then uh, do a very high-level overview of uh, the chip seq uh, data analysis workflow. And then in our practicum, uh, after the coffee break, uh, we'll then uh, work on uh, running uh, a, a script called FASTQC uh, to uh, look at the quality of the FASTQ outputs. Okay, so given the, the, the background of, of this audience, uh, I like to use this analogy, uh, which is, uh, as, I, I'm, as I'm sure some of you have heard, if we think about the, the genome as a, a hard drive, uh, really the epigenome is the software that runs on top of it. And the way we like to describe this as part of the roadmap project was this idea of a, a roadmap. So it's a way of the cell interpreting the genome. Uh, through, through the layout of uh, essentially roads and networks uh, uh, that that particular cell can interpret the genome. So the genome, of a, <clears throat> the genome of, a, of a liver cell and the genome of a pancreatic cell is, of course, the same, um, but the roadmap in which that's interpreted is different, and that roadmap is, in, is encoded within uh, the epigenome. I always like to start my epigenome talks with going back to the history, and uh, as of course I'm sure everyone is aware, uh, the term uh, epigenome or epigenotype was actually coined by uh, Conrad Waddington back in 1942 before we even knew uh, that DNA was the hereditary material. And he was using this as a way of describing uh, how phenotype, how genotype um, uh, became phenotype in the context of uh, mouse, or uh, <laughs> mouse, of fly wing development. Uh, and these are, I actually found this uh, journal uh, in, in the archives at UBC, and, uh, and that's the actual figure there. So if we, if we flash, if we, you know, sort of fast forward and think about what actually we were talking about here, really talking about genotype uh, giving rise to phenotype, and of course, there are many components of that. Transcription, transcription factors, um, uh, uh, ex external cellular uh, signaling, MAP kinase signaling, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many components to it, and of course, the epigenome is just one component of it. And a, you know, a few years after uh, Conrad uh, coined the term of epigenome, he came up with this, uh, this diagram that I think probably everybody in this room is familiar with, uh, this concept of starting from a sort of open plastic state of a totipotent zygote and kind of running down this, um, this, uh, uh, these valleys. And as we, as we differentiate down into terminally differentiated uh, cell types, such as blood T cells or breasts, or myoepithelial cells or brain cells, neurons or glia, uh, that, the epi, that the epigenome becomes more and more uh, restricted. Okay? But of course, as all things in biology, nothing is in black and white. And we now know that, in fact, we can, 
we can actually get over these little humps, right? We can reprogram cells and we can reprogram the epigenome. Uh, although that reprogramming, at least the best that we understand, is not uh, complete. So, so I, I heard uh, amongst the, the folks that were uh, here today that some people are studying the environmental interactions. Of course, that's another very interesting aspect of the epigenome, the fact that it's potentially reversible and the fact that it interacts with the environment. So in this concept, the epigenome is providing a, a, a way of, of the cell interacting in a, in a, in a, um, in a time frame, uh, in a much shorter time frame than perhaps uh, genetic uh, uh, changes uh, would occur in a, as a consequence of evolution. And if we think about it, if we have an environmental impact that infects the, the epigenome, uh, that might affect the epigenome of, for example, uh, a breast cell. And that may have, uh, you know, uh, negative or, or in some cases perhaps positive consequences. If we look epidemiologically, um, there's some curious data out there. Um, and I heard somebody studying hereditary, uh, so uh, how epigenetic marks are um, are passed on. And of course, this is a one of the, this is a famous study um, looking at uh, data from a, a northern Swedish town called Ovalax where they looked at um, dietary intake or, or uh, the harvest, uh, and then look at the um, mortality rates of, uh, the, uh, of the parents, of the grandparents, the parents, and, and the grandchildren. And they came up with this curious relationship between uh, uh, increased uh, nutrient uptake and uh, an increase in mortality uh, of the grandchildren. And so there's these, 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 these um, observations that suggest that these um, epigenetic marks are in fact heritable, okay? Uh, and so if we think about it in that context, an environmental impact that might impact, say, uh, a parent uh, could potentially be passed on to their offspring. And in fact, um, that could then be passed on uh, to further generations. But I would just like to point out that as of today, there actually isn't um, there, there, are no, there is no concrete evidence of hereditary. When we talk about hereditary in the context of epigenetics, what we're talking about is mitotic inheritance. We're not talking about transgenerational inheritance. And so I think that's something important as you begin your careers or, or those of you who are already well in your careers uh, to, to understand is that our concept of, of this inheritance is really at the mitotic level, not uh, transgenerational. Okay. So the, the classic... Um, description of what epigenetics is. It's the study of heritable. And again, when I talk about heritable, I'm talking about mitotic inheritance. So changes in gene expression that occur uh, without a change in DNA sequence. And there have been a number of technologies developed, in fact, over the last uh, 10 years to study the epigenome. And initially, this was done uh, using arrays, but now, as I think everyone in this room knows, uh, this has been largely uh, transferred to massively parallel sequencing technologies, and we'll be talking about um, two of those technologies in this uh, workshop. Um, we'll be talking about ChIP-seq, which everyone, I think, is familiar with, which is the study of uh, histone um, modifications uh, in the context of nucleosomes, and we study those, again, using chip sequencing. There are technologies such as DNAs1 sequencing, really pioneered by John Stamm at, at Washington University for looking at open regions of chromatin, so this concept of open and closed regions of chromatin. And these DNAs, one's hypersensitive sites have been leveraged uh, by John and by many others in the research community as regions of uh, open chromatin that are engaged uh, by transcription factors. Um, RNA, of course, is, has been shown in, in some cases to play a role in, in mediating epigenetic regulation. Uh, and we study this uh, using sequencing, using RNA-seq. But of course, RNA-seq isn't one thing, it's many things. Uh, so it depends on the molecular biology that is uh, driving the generation of the, of the uh, libraries that go onto the sequencer, uh, you know, depending on if you're using polyadenylated or uh, ribodepleted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, the DNA itself is modified. So in mammalian genomes, you have about 58 million uh, CPGs, uh, and these are methylated, uh, and I'm not going to go into, into that today. Uh, Guillaume and uh, David will be talking about that tomorrow. And of course, these things don't, um, epigenetic modifications don't um, operate uh, individually. They operate as, as David Alice has coined as a histone code, as far as we know. 
So for example, we can have open regions of chromatin that are DNA methylated, and these would be presumably, or these have been shown to be uh, resistant to, to certain transcription factor uh, recruitment. And so DNA is one hypersensitive sites that are hypomethylated are those sites that are, uh, that are thought to be actively engaged in uh, or actively bound by transcription factors. Okay, so in today's talk, I'm going to be focused on uh, chip sequencing. Uh, and here's a, uh, a diagram of, uh, of a, a nucleosome. Uh, and as I'm sure everyone in this room is aware, uh, the nucleosome uh, contains core histone molecule uh, and then an unstructured uh, N-terminal tail. And these unstructured N-terminal tails are, are decorated with uh, a variety of post-transcriptional modifications, including some of them that are shown here. So there's acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, ubiquitation, sumylation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's a whole series of enzymes, um, the, the so-called readers, writers, and erasers um, that uh, many of us study. Uh, and these enzymes work uh, to um, add, remove, um, uh, and, and read uh, the histone code. And of course, the Structural Genomics Consortium, as, as well as many others, uh, are focusing on, on understanding these enzymes or, or uh, generating structures for the enzymes, as well as uh, generating inhibitors uh, to them. Okay, so there are hundreds of epigenetic modifications, which is very daunting. Um, and so how do we begin to study these? Well. Um, back in 2008, uh, the Common Fund, the NIH Common Fund, funded the, the so-called Roadmap Epigenomics Consortium, and its task was to generate so-called reference epigenomes. Um, and, and as uh, the first meeting, in fact, uh, of the Roadmap that we had in, in Bethesda, in, in Washington, uh, we came up with a description of what a reference epigenome was. And, and how we came upon that uh, description was essentially pioneering work from the ONCODE consortium, which some of you might be aware, where we tried to uh, select a set of histone modifications that uh, describe the variability of the epigenome uh, as broadly as possible. So many epigenetic modifications are actually appear to be redundant. When you have one, you can call the other by the, by the presence of, of one. So for example, at promoter, at active promoters, we may have uh, H3K4 trimethylation, uh, and that is co-occurs, for example, with H3K27 acetylation. So perhaps both of those would not need to be done uh, uh, to, to mark promoters. So I do just want to briefly mention, so these are the uh, six marks uh, that were selected um, by the consortium uh, to generate the so-called core reference uh, set. Uh, and these are the modifications that uh, have been um, adopted by the International Human Epigenome Consortium, of which the CERC network, a, a co-funder of this, or at least a, a funder of some of the travel awards, is part of. Now, how are histone modifications, um, what is the nomenclature? So this is the, the, the accepted nomenclature for how we describe histone modifications. So they start with the histone itself, so in this case, H3. Uh, the next two characters indicate what um, amino acid is modified, so this is, in this case, histone H3, lysine 4, uh, and then trimethylation. Methylation can, occurs, uh, can, occurs, can of course occur as monomethylated, dimethylated, or trimethylated, and so I'm showing you in this, this particular case the trimethylated form. So H3K4 trimethylation, H3K9 uh, trimethylation. That should be pretty uh, straightforward. So the, in terms of the reference core marks, there are two sets, uh, those that um, act to reinforce uh, open chromatin or active chromatin, and that's this set here. Uh, so um, H3K4 tri is active promoters, enhancers, H3 mono, K27 acetyl, and then K36 trimethylation associated with elongating transcription. Of course, you know, we could spend a lot of time talking about each one of these, but um, I'm just giving you a very uh, high-level overview. Uh, there's also uh, two marks that are associated with oppressive chromatin, H3K9 trimethylation and H3K27 tri trimethylation. And we'll be talking um, more about the, the characteristics of these marks um, and why they've been labeled uh, in these ways as we go through, through the lecture today. Okay, so, so I talked about what epigenetics is. Uh, we talked about some of the epidemiological. Of course, there are other epigenetic effects that have been uh, annotated, which has made this uh, this field, I think, very interesting as a, as a field to study. Uh, some of you might be aware of the, the, Dun the Dutch hunger winter or uh, in, in China, the Great Leap Forward, where uh, population was uh, put under severe caloric restriction 
uh, and the babies that were born of the women that were pregnant during that period of time uh, had a higher incidence or have shown a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease, psychiatric disorders, etc. And, and what is potentially um, uh, even more interesting in some ways is that the, the grandchildren, so that the children of those children are also showing these characteristics. And so, of course, epigenetics has been evoked as a possible mechanism to describe uh, how this uh, is being inherited through the generations, although, as I mentioned, uh, as of today, we don't have any direct evidence uh, for this. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about the reasons for that in the break. We also know for common traits and diseases, the link between genotype uh, is not as strong. So for some characteristics, such as height, um, if we look at the difference between monozygotic and dizygotic twins, um, you can you can evoke uh, genetic mechanisms, can describe uh, a significant portion of the, of the uh, variation in the population. But for many common diseases, uh, it isn't. So in many cases, one twin uh, will develop, for example, breast cancer, but the other will not. So this suggests that genetic mechanisms are not the sole mechanisms for, for driving these uh, or for the, the uh, incidence of these diseases. And more recently, memory. Uh, it seems as though many, or at least some functions of memory, uh, are being patterned uh, through epigenetic mechanisms. In this particular case, I'm showing you uh, a memory model in fly uh, uh, using a knockout of a, of, of a particular epigenetic uh, modifier, uh, G9A. So in the field that I work in, which is cancer, um, so uh, as, as I think some of you are probably aware, again, uh, thanks uh, in large part to the technological advance of sequencing, uh, we've spent the last uh, almost decade uh, deeply sequencing a wide variety of, of cancer genomes. And one of the surprising findings that emerged from that work is that, epi that genetic lesions to epigenetic modifiers appear to be very common events in many types of cancers, and in some cancers more than others. Uh, one of the type of cancer I study is myeloid malignancies, and in myeloid malignancies there seems to be a high uh, prevalence of mutations to, uh, to epigenetic modifiers. Um, for example, IDH1, IDH2. Um, which generates an oncal metabolite um, and other enzymes, DMT3A, which is involved in uh, laying down DNA meth um, methylation, TET2, which is involved in hydroxymethylation. So both in epidemiological studies as well as through cancer genome sequencing, uh, I think the epigenome is being, um, uh, I think you know, the, the link between uh, the disease and the, and, and the relationship of the epigenome is being uh, established. Okay, so that was sort of my 10-minute, very high-level overview of the epigenome, um, just as a way of introduction. Uh, this is the summary. Are there any questions, or does anyone have any comments about the, uh, the biology of the epigenome you'd like to raise now? If not, I'll move on to the next section. I'm not hearing anything. Okay, so, so that's the epigenome, but what we're really here to, to learn about is, is the bioinformatics behind how we actually study it. And so for, for uh, the lecture this morning, I'll be talking about chromatin immunoprecipitation <laughs> sequencing. So what is ChIP-seq? So ChIP-seq is essentially a way of, uh, of uh, profiling um, uh, histone modifications uh, genome-wide. Uh, and this is a, a diagram that I came up with a number of years ago, which essentially uh, shows you the, the flow of, of how this works. So essentially, we start with a cell or a genome, and then we digest the genome or we shear the genome. Um, so we either use sonication waves to shear it, or we can digest it with uh, MNAs, so uh, so-called native chip sequencing, which is something that's becoming more uh, more prevalent uh, in the literature. Um, or we can use cross-linking, so we use formaldehyde cross-linking, and then we shear the DNA uh, using uh, 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 sonication sound waves. Um, once we have those shears, and we typically shear into the range of 100 to 300 base pairs, which coincidentally, of course, is within the range of a single nucleosome wrap. So a single wrap of, of DNA around a nucleosome is about 150 base pairs. Um, but the, the actual range of 100 to 300 came out of initial experiments on the Selexa platform, which turned out to be the, about the appropriate length for generating clusters, which we'll get into in, in a moment. Um, uh, and so that's the, the, the typical range that the shearing is done. So once we have this sheared set of uh, fragments, either by native uh, digestion uh, or by sonication, we then immunoprecipitate with an antibody um, that's specific for that histone modification, uh, which is shown there. We then um, 
which essentially enriches for those DNA fragments that are associated to the nucleosomes that are modified in, in the way that, or modified with the uh, modification that, that we're interested in. So then we have an enriched set of fragments uh, we, that we can then study. The original experiments done by Bing Ren and, and others used chip-chip data, so they basically used a, a chip array. Uh, so they, you, you strip off the proteins, you're left with the DNA, you can label it and, and, um, and probe a, a, an array, either a promoter array or a tiling array. Um, of course, that technology has been largely replaced now with our ability to actually sequence those fragments. And so we take those fragments, strip off the proteins, and we generate a, uh, a library, a so-called library, and a, and a library is essentially a collection of fragments uh, that we've added um, uh, DNA sequences to the end that allow us to generate uh, clusters and then sequence them. And once we sequence them, we then align them to a reference genome, uh, and then we, we build essentially profiles of what those modifications are. Okay, so what are some key considerations in performing chip sequencing? So uh, first of all, antibody specificity and sensitivity. I can't stress this enough. Uh, if you're working with data that others have generated, I would take the time to figure out what uh, QC has been done on the antibody, okay? Um, the other uh, consideration is what marks should I profile? Again, it would depend on what, what you're trying to do. If you're interested in polycomb group, you probably want to study H3K27 trimethylation. If you're interested in, uh, in enhancer states, then you'll probably want to study H3K4 monomethylation, H3K27 acetylation. If you're interested in, for example, uh, in, uh, endogenous retroviral uh, silencing, then perhaps H3K9 trimethylation uh, is the appropriate mark. So it really depends on the question that you're trying to ask, um, and, I, and you need to design your experiment and pick the marks uh, that, will, that, that will best answer that question. Sequencing depth. This is a question I get asked all the time. <laughs> so so what, how deeply should I sequence the marks? And, I, and what I've given you here are actually the current recommendations for the International Human Epigenome Consortium. When we first started the roadmap project, um, uh, sequencing capacities were much reduced compared to what they are today. And back then, we had a, a, uh, our target was 12 million reads uh, per, uh, per IP. But we've subsequently learned that that's insufficient to, to sample the diversity of the uh, libraries that are being pulled down. Okay, And so the, the current uh, depth uh, recommendations are essentially 50 million read pairs, which, which is equivalent to 25 million clusters, right? So 25 million observations of the fragments, so to read pairs, of course, we're reading both ends of the fragment. I'll go into that in a little bit of detail for punctate marks. And so that would be a, an example of a mark that, that, that has a punctate observation in the genome is, for example, H3K4 trimethylation or H3K27 acetylation, right? These marks tend to have very um, punctate um, uh, occupancy of the genome. And for broader marks, such as H3K9 trimethylation, in many cases H3K4 monomethylation is also considered to be a broad mark. Uh, it's, it's found uh, very widely diverse, uh, uh, dispersed on the genome. Uh, a, a higher read depth is recommended. And there we're getting to 100 million reads uh, or um, uh, 50 million fragments. Okay, so those are the current recommendations. And again, be happy to discuss the details of that uh, as we um, uh, uh, during the break or, or later in the lecture. Okay, I guess the other point to, to keep in mind is if you are working with data sets that are generated from limiting numbers of cells. So I talked about native chip sequencing. So the original formaldehyde crosslink uh, sequencing, uh, we would go in with about a million cells. Which obviously is not, which is a lot of cells. Cell lines, not a big deal. When we're talking about primary human tissue, that becomes very limiting. Native chip sequencing, where we're not using formaldehyde crosslinking, is a way of actually do, reducing that, those numbers uh, significantly. So you're able to get down to 100,000 or even 10,000 cells. When we're down to limiting numbers of cells, you can actually sample the diversity of that library. Um, with less reads uh, than is required to sample the diversity of, say, a, a, a cross-link library that comes through, uh, uh, that comes from a million cells. Uh, and so as you design your experiment, you should be thinking about, okay, really what I'm trying to do here is sequence the diversity of that immunoprecipitated library uh, to sufficient depth to be able to represent it uh, in, in, in our, the subsequent analysis. Okay, so I'm just going to spend a little time talking about ChIP-seq um, antibody validation. Uh, 
and I'm sure everyone in this room has heard this before, but garbage in, garbage out, right? So if we don't know what the specificity of the antibody is, um, the data that you're going to get out of it, and you're going to spend a lot of time analyzing it, is not going to be um, uh, of, of high quality. So I really uh, recommend you, you spend the time to understand the biology. If you're doing the immunoprecipitation yourself, spend the time to find the right antibody and QC that antibody. As it is today, there are no, um, as far as I'm aware, there are no high-quality um, uh, ChIP-seq antibodies that you can rely on time in, time out. Um, with the exception of some, some monoclonal antibodies, so there, there is one, for example, from cell signaling technologies, which is a monoclonal, but most antibodies that are commercially available are polyclonal, which means there's only a limited amount. Um, and you may order that lot, uh, and in six months, you may order it again, and it'll be a, a different lot. So within our own center, um, as part of the, the uh, initially the roadmap and now through the, the CERC um, initiative, uh, we do a series of, of QC on all antibodies that we bring into, into the group or into production. And this includes uh, um, a antibody peptide array or a peptide array. Uh, this is uh, essentially a, an array of uh, 384 uh, modified peptides and we look for specificity and so that's what's showing here. I can't actually read this because it's so small but I'm hoping that's the, so this would be the, the mark, the targeted mark here, H3K4 trimethylation. You can see there's some off-target effects um, but the majority of, of signal comes from the, the, uh, the antibody. We also do a western blot um, to look for specificity in the IP. So here we're essentially blotting a whole, uh, a whole cell lysate and then looking for uh, the specific uh, um, uh, band to show specificity. And if we're ordering a new catalog number from a vendor, we will also take this all the way through the chip sequencing and compare it against um, uh, bioinformatic um, uh, QC metrics that I'll talk about a little bit later uh, in, the, in the lecture. Uh, to ensure that its performance is, is what we expect. And, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time hunting down uh, antibodies um, that, are, uh, that, are, uh, that pass these metrics. And I can tell you, even today, you could go out and order, a, you know, a gold standard chip seek antibody as annotated by the vendor, and it will fail these QC analysis. Okay, so do not, um, my recommendation, if you're working in a chip seek, spend the time to QC your antibody. And once you've found an antibody that passes QC, get as much of it as you can within the limits of, of, of how much you're going to run. Uh, here's another example, uh, acetylated antibodies. Um, this is H3K27 acetylation. Um, you can see, I just wanted to show you this, just to show you that the off-target effects of K27 acetylation antibodies are higher than we see typically with methylated antibodies. Uh, and this is something that um, uh, is is just a, a fact of, uh, of this, these, this particular epitope, uh, and, and there are off-target effects to keep in mind. Okay, so are there any questions about that? Um, th this, this data, if you're interested, is, is available here. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested in looking at the, at the, the, uh, the QC of these antibodies, uh, and I'd be happy to discuss it later. Okay, so uh, talking about chip-seq processing. So uh, this is one way that I like to think about it, and I think in the, uh, one of the uh, handouts or, or the rec recommended reading, uh, this, uh, the, the manuscript that describes this process flow was included. Uh, and essentially what this shows is, is this so-called concept of levels of analysis, so level 0, level 1, level 2, level 3. Uh, and I'm going to spend today, or I'm going to spend uh, my lecture primarily focused on level 0. So basically going from the sequence library uh, to the FASTQ file, what that is. Uh, and then Misha will be talking about level one, which is essentially taking that FASTQ file and aligning it, and then level two uh, doing the segmentation. And I guess in tomorrow's lecture, we'll, we'll be talking a little bit about level three, which is integration, visualization, uh, and, and analysis. So to start with, I'm going to be talking about chip seek processing. Uh, I'll be talking about the, the generation of the FASTQ files. Okay, so um, of course, chip is CHIP-seq, is stands for chip sequencing. Uh, and so uh, understanding the basic principles about how the sequencing works uh, is, is a, an important first step uh, to doing any bioinformatic analysis that's dependent upon uh, the, the resulting files. So of course, uh, Sanger sequencing uh, is uh, uh, 
the first high throughput sequencing technology that was ever developed. This, of course, Dr. Sanger here, uh, who actually won uh, two Nobel Prizes, which is always pretty amazing. Uh, one for sequencing protein and one for sequencing DNA. Um, you know, these are the gels that not so long ago represented really the state of the art uh, in uh, DNA sequencing. And, and of course, this involved this involves the incorporation of uh, uh, terminally uh, uh, or dideoxy uh, nucleotides, um, which are either radioactively labeled or fluorescently labeled and then visualized. This was industrialized as part of the Human Genome Project, um, where we went from these slab gels to capillary gels. Uh, first, single capillaries in the instrument at the time, which is the ABI 310. Uh, and then to the 3730, uh, and then the farms of these, literally hundreds of these instruments were then arrayed out at some of the big genome centers, for example, WashU, uh, the Broad, uh, Sanger Center, uh, and these were the, the instruments that uh, generated the Human Genome Project. So why do I bring these up? I bring these up because when uh, sequencing was first uh, developed, we had no way of assessing the quality of a sequence, right? We, we got a, an A or a T or a C or a G off the back end of these platforms, or even if you look at, at this gel, well, I can say that in this lane here, it looks like a C, but how do, I how do I encode quality of these bases? And this, of course, becomes important when we start talking about tens of thousands or millions or hundreds of millions of sequencing reads. And so um, uh, Phil, Phil Green here from Washington University, uh, developed the so-called FRED quality standard, which is shown here which is essentially a log transform probability, okay? So it's a probability that that base is called incorrectly or correctly, and, um, uh, and the, the formula is here. How are these probabilities determined? Well, these probabilities are determined essentially empirically, okay? So they're determined by looking at the performance of, uh, in this case, uh, uh, trace, which I'll talk about in the, in the next slide, and then developing a series of, uh, of of um, uh, essentially, um, in this case, four um, uh, characteristics that would then go into uh, uh, calculating this probability. And so, you know, in FRED, this is what it looks like in an analog sequencer sequencing run. So this is a, uh, essentially a, an, an example of a trace that I hope everyone in, in this room is very familiar with. And I can't actually read this. But you can see that, for example, this base here, this uh, T, is very well separated from its adjacent T's, and you get a nice separation. You don't have a high background coming up. And so based on these four metrics, uh, this base is given a, a very high uh, FRED score, a FRED of 50, which is 99.99% um, uh, uh, accurate. A base, for example, uh, here, where you, you're getting a much less separation between the bases, and you have a higher background is given a lower uh, FRED score, and I can't actually read what it is, I think it's FRED 10, which is essentially a 90% probability that, it, that, that it's correct. And then there's bases here where you can't even tell what it is, in this case it's given an N, and it's given a very low uh, FRED score. So in the, the initial generation of Selexa data, which then became Illumina, and this was true also of the solid system and true of the ion torrent system, there was no way of calculating qualities because we had no empirical standards to work against. And so the initial quality scores that were generated on these platforms were essentially based on taking that, those reads and realigning them to the reference genome and seeing what the, mis, uh, what the um, mismatch rate was, which of course is fraught with difficulties because we have SNPs and we have other variations in our, in our reference genome which would skew our quality scores. But over time, um, a similar set of characteristics, and I'm not going to go through them, were developed for how, how separated the clusters are, how uh, the intensity of the bases, uh, the intensity of the fluorescence for the clusters, as we'll talk about, uh, which allowed us to move into a, uh, essentially a log transformed quality scores. So now for Illumina sequencing, we, uh, for every base, we have a log transform quality, which is based on the FRED system, but using a different set of empirical um, measures. Okay. The other thing I want to keep, I want you to keep in mind, especially if you're looking at historical data, is that there's been a, a rapid development of the next generation sequencing platforms. And so, I think you know this is showing from this was the in, initial instrument that I was actually introduced to in the fall of 2006, uh, which is the Selexa instrument. And in in in, the, in only you know six years, we went from this instrument to this instrument. 
And that in involved a lot of different changes, including the incorporation of these quality standards, incorporation of paradigm reads, incorporating of the index read. So there are many changes that went on. And so as you go back historically into the data, uh, you, you need to be aware of you know, what, what, what relative time period we're talking about, what Illumina uh, processing pipeline was used or solid processing pipeline was used uh, to generate that data because it has uh, consequences. I'll talk about one as we get into it, but for example, ASCII quality scores. There was a time when the ASCII base was 64 uh, for uh, Illumina uh, and is 33 for FASTQ. So if you go back for, far enough and you find some of that original data, you got to be aware of what ASCII system you're working in. So it's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so how does uh, library generation work? Um, this is how it works for those of you who don't work in the lab. So, you know, we've talked about, you know, the IP or you can start from DNA or CDNA or whatever you like. You shear into a set of random fragments and then we ligate adapters to it or there are other technologies for introducing the adapters, but I'll just uh, give this uh, basic overview. So we, we ligate adapters and then we uh, usually do a PCR uh, step uh, to add uh, oligos on the end of these fragments uh, that are complementary to the oligos that are grafted onto the flow cell surface, okay? And these are what enable us to do uh, sequencing uh, on, a, on, on, the, on the Illumina system. And more recently, within the last five years, uh, we've also include uh, index sequences. So we include a hexamer index, which is incorporated into the adapter that allows us then to pool multiple libraries together on a single lane of Illumina, uh, and then they are subsequently uh, divided by index uh, and when you see your analysis, it's all from the same lane, uh, but they're labeled by their index, uh, uh, which is incorporated again uh, into the barcode. More recent, more recent technologies now uh, incorporate two barcodes, so you can have scenarios where you have barcodes on both ends of the fragment, uh, which allows for even, uh, in, uh, even higher orders of, of multiplexing uh, or, or error correction. The current generation of uh, HiSeq sequencer is here. So this is the HiSeq uh, 2500 or, or 4000. Uh, that's the output of it. There's also, of course, some of you may have heard of the HiSeq X platform. Um, there's a few of these. Uh, uh, there's three, three uh, such platforms here in Canada and, of course, in the U.S. and many other places. But just let's keep in mind when you're doing your experimental design that you can't use the X platform for chip sequencing because Illumina doesn't allow it. Um, so you can't use it, so you'll have to base it on the, the HiSeq sequencer. Uh, this is what a, a flow cell looks like. And now I'm going to go through uh, how we actually do the, um, uh, the sequencing itself. OK, so we start with the, the DNA fragments. Uh, we ligate the adapters. And in here, these are the uh, purple and blue things. So we, we end up with this collection of fragments that have these purple and blue um, ends on them. Uh, and then we flow them over a, a flow cell surface onto which uh, oligos that are complementary uh, to either uh, the, the blue or the purple have been grafted to the glass of the flow cell. The original Illumina sequencers had, were able to image one side of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of this piece of glass. More recent generation, like 2500s and 4000s, actually image both sides. So you have, uh, flow, you have surface one and surface two. But essentially, the principle is the same. Uh, we, we, we generate these, or we capture these clusters uh, on the flow cell surface. Now, what about other sequencing technologies, such as solid sequencing, or Illumina, or uh, ion torrent sequencing? It uses a very simple, similar process, but instead of grafting onto a solid, flow, uh, solid surface, we're grafting onto beads. So we're grafting in, in, in what's so-called an emulsion. So we're generating an emulsion where we're adding our fragments. We have a bead that's been decorated on the outside with the uh, oligos that are um, complementary to the oligos that you've added on, the, on your uh, adapter. And then we go through our, our um, um, uh, amplification. Now, what's the advantages or different disadvantages of the two systems? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that for emulsion, we're really um, we need to be thinking about Poisson distribution. So when we're talking about sampling the library, we're really looking at, um, uh, because we have to generate an emulsion, and we want to drive that emulsion so that on average uh, that we have uh, uh, one bead and one fragment of DNA, we have many, many of our uh, so-called microreactors or micelles that have only one bead, no 
uh, piece of DNA, and many that have DNA, and many that are very em that are empty. And so the volumes that are required to actually do emulsion PCR uh, are significantly higher, and the amount of material you need uh, is significantly higher than it is on, on say, a solid surface. So, so uh, and, and for today's lecture, I'm going to primarily uh, talk about, um, uh, or I'm going to exclusively talk about aluminous sequencing, but the principles are essentially the same. Okay, so we flow this over, we, we engraft, um, and from there we then, through a, a process of random uh, dif dis diffusion, uh, the, uh, the piece of DNA flops over, hybridizes to uh, its parents uh, that's in the vicinity, and of course the original Lumina sequencers, this is random distribution of these, these fragments were randomly grafted onto the flow cell surface, so they're all over the place. In the HiSeq 4000 and the X platform, these are now printed in an ordered array, and that has some implications, which I'll very briefly touch on. Uh, but for the vast majority of data that you'll see that's been generated, and probably the data that you're going to be generating would be done on the 2500, which is uh, an unordered array, so it's a random array. Okay, uh, so uh, so you essentially get this. Um, where you get a, a diffusion, uh, then you get a priming event has occurred that uh, occurs here because you've got your purple here and your purple, your five prime to three prime, and we do a single extension, uh, so isothermal extension, and this generates essentially a copy of that fragment. So then we repeat that process 30 times or 28 times or whatever, however many times you're generating your clusters. We generate a group of clusters that are or a group of fragments that are clonal copies of the original captured piece, okay? We then go through, uh, we essentially use either chemistry or enzymatic uh, process to cleave one end of that fragment, uh, and so we're left with a single-stranded molecules that are oriented in this way that allows us to prime uh, to, uh, to do a sequencing reaction. And again, to make the point that, that in the uh, 2500 and earlier uh, series of the Lumina, uh, these fragments were in fact randomly distributed on, on, the, on the flow cell surface, and this will become important uh, when we talk about sequence naming. Okay, how does sequencing work itself? So now we're just blowing into, uh, into one end of it. We essentially add our, our fragment, or our uh, sequencing primer, and our uh, sequencing reagents, um, and then we incorporate uh, one base uh, per cycle. And of course, the technology that founded Illumina is this idea of reversible terminators, which uh, separates it from Sanger sequencing, where once that uh, base is incorporated, it's permanently terminated. Illumina technology allows for reversible termination. So in other words, we can incorporate one base, stop the extension, uh, and then uh, uh, remove that, uh, that, um, that termination and allow the, the sequencing to continue. This is in contrast to, for example, ion torrent sequencing or solid sequencing, which doesn't use reversible terminators. Rather, it flows each of the nucleotides over one at a time, uh, which causes, uh, which can be uh, problematic for homopolymeric repeats, etc. But essentially, we get one incorporation event. Um, we remove the unincorporated bases. We shine a laser uh, and detect the signal. And then we uh, essentially repeat that process over and over again to build that um, to build that sequence uh, uh, base by base. So very uh, conceptually, this is how the, uh, the, the sequencing itself actually works. So we start with our first, um, essentially our first incorporation event, cycle one. And then cycle one, we generate what's known as the focal map. Okay, and the focal map gives us positions of where each of these clusters are on the flow cell surface. So if we think about... Um, So if we think about a flow cell, so we can think of a flow cell as a lane, we divide the flow cell into tiles, okay? And each tile there has a, an x and a y coordinate to it, okay? And when we have a series of um, clusters generated, each of these clusters get, gets an x and y coordinate. So for, perhaps this is x5, y1, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This becomes important because these x, y coordinates are essentially how the sequences are named and how the sequences uh, have unique identifiers amongst the millions or in some case billions of, of reads that you might generate in the course of an experiment. So the first, gener the first step is generating this focal map. Uh, and for those of you who have done some Illumina sequencing, you'll know that if you use a, 
uh, a, a library that has reduced diversity in the first few bases. You may have issues with generating your focal map. And the reason for that is because if, if all of my bases in the first uh, incorporation are, for example, uh, what's green here, T, then I'm going to get a very strong T signal. And I'm not going to be able to see the difference or the, the I'm not going to be able to separate the individual clusters. And so this uh, becomes a problem. There are solutions around that, for example, spiking in a diverse library such as PhiX, uh, uh, for example. Newer generation sequencing platforms like the HiC4000 use an ordered array. And so this issue uh, is no longer relevant. OK, so we start with a focal map. And then we essentially we build the sequence one base at a time uh, from there. And at every incorporation, we uh, scan or we take an image. Uh, and uh, that image stack builds up. OK, so then we. To convert the images to sequences, we essentially, you can think of those stacks as being uh, stacked up. We basically flip through the cards looking at that same focal position. So let's, just, let's say this is tile 1. So looking at tile 1, position y, y1, x5, that's say a t, and then becomes a g, a c, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's essentially how the sequences are built up um, from the images. OK. So uh, the initial sequencing. Um, uh, generated by Selexa was primarily single end reads. And so when we talk about that, we have our fragment, we have our adapters on the end of it. I don't know if everyone can see this, maybe not. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, so we have our fragment, we have our, um, our adapters on the end, and we would sequence in from one end. And in fact, the data that we're, um, we're going to be uh, talking about today is single end data. And in fact, uh, a significant amount of ChIP-seq data is still generated by single end. Uh, Misha will talk about the advantages of doing paired end reads when, when it comes to Illumina sequencing, but or ChIP-seq sequencing. But initially, it was single end, uh, and this is showing essentially the chemistry of how this works. Um, so um, uh, I, I already talked about the cluster generation, essentially stripping off uh, and then allowing a priming event. And to generate the second read, so to read in from the other strand, so now reading in on the other side, the way we actually do this is by regenerating the cluster on the flow cell surface. So this is done on the instrument. We regenerate the cluster. And then we strip off the other, the other strand. And that's done very simply by incorporating uh, two different um, uh, uh, bases or uh, modified bases, either chemically modified or or a uracil substitution uh, on the oligos that are grafted on the flow cell surface. So this allows us to control which one we cleave and allows us to do paired end reads. OK, so any questions on that? OK, if not, we'll talk about the uh, base calling. Well, OK, so in terms of the analysis steps, I've already sort of gone through this. So first step is base calling, which is what we're going to talk about now. Uh, second step is reference alignment, uh, which uh, Misha will be talking about. And then application-specific analysis, for example, uh, segmentation. So uh, on an Illumina HiSeq uh, system, you know, we essentially go from uh, terabytes of images, um, which are now not even stored, uh, to an intensity files, uh, and then to essentially the FASTQ file uh, and an intermediate step that used to be generated called a QSeq file, um, uh, which contains uh, the base quals and the qualities. Okay? Uh, some considerations in terms of the sequencing itself, and you, you know, most of this is fairly black box now, um, but just for historical stake, I'll talk about a couple of considerations. One is uh, phasing and pre-phasing. So we can think about when we're sequencing ChIP-seq libraries, we have this cluster of sequences. Um, and as we go through the step-by-step -step addition of, of nucleotides, those clusters can, can come out of phase. And there can be strands within that cluster that either get ahead of the others. Perhaps there was a nucleotide that was incorporated that wasn't fully terminated, and we got two incorporations at that step. Or some, some, uh, some others, uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, a deprotection didn't work, and we didn't get incorporation. And so we get either phasing or pre-phasing events. And in fact, these phasing and pre-phasing events are what really limits the read lengths of these platforms. Because eventually, your phasing and pre-phasing become so dominant that you can't call the majority base anymore. So this still remains one of the, the, lim one of the uh, technical hurdles for generating longer read lengths uh, on these platforms. 
So phasing and prephasing is something to, to keep in mind. Uh, this is all fairly black box now, so unless you go back to some pretty historical data, you probably don't need to worry about this. Uh, the, other, um, uh, the other thing that is worth knowing is the so-called chastity filter. Uh, this is the formula for how the chastity is, is calculated. And essentially, chastity is a way of determining the purity of that, um, of that particular cluster. So when we think about a cluster on a ray, we may get examples where two clusters are very close to one another, or two clusters may be actually overlapping, in which case the, our ability to call the accurate sequence for that cluster is, is obviously uh, uh, impaired. And so this concept of chastity, which is essentially looking at the brightest intensity of whatever um, nucleotide is, is, or whatever fluorescent uh, base comes uh, for that cycle, uh, over the brightest intensity plus the second brightest intensity. And this has to be greater than or equal to 0.6. Uh, and for current generation sequencers, that's over the first 25 bases with one allowed failure. And essentially what this is doing is flagging polyclonal clusters. Okay? This is true all the way up to the 2500 system. But after the 2500 system, when we get into ordered arrays, um, chastity is, is, has been uh, uh, disabled. So there are no longer any chastity failed reads, and when you get a, if you get a, a file, a FASTQ file, or a, uh, from uh, uh, from a, a 4000, you'll see that there are no uh, flagged reads anymore. Okay, <clears throat> so what is the what is the output of uh, of the of the the high seq? How do, what does the file actually look like? This is a file that you probably won't um, ever see unless you're uh, working on the sequencer itself. Uh, but I wanted to show it because it kind of shows the intermediate step before we get to the FASTQ file. So essentially how this, what this file is, is on the top here you can see a series of information related to that particular run. And it's actually the concatenation of this information which becomes the sequence name itself, which is how we identify that sequence in all subsequent analysis. Okay? So uh, for example, it will include instrument ID, the run ID, um, which of course isn't unique, the lane ID, um, but it'll also have the tile, so in this case tile 1101, uh, and then the X and Y coordinate that I just talked to you about. So that's actually how we identify um, uh, each uh, of the individual reads. Uh, and then there are uh, what read it is and chastity passed or failed. Uh, the sequence is then provided, and the sequence is provided in, in you know, uh, ACTs and Gs, uh, and then the quality scores are provided, okay? Uh, and the quality scores are uh, FRED, so these are log-transformed quality scores. But instead of encoding them as numeric digits, they're encoded in ASCII, okay? And I'll talk about that uh, briefly. Uh, and then uh, the chastity uh, pass or fail. So this is the QSeq file. So, so, so these uh, values are, are FRED-like uh, uh, FRED log-transformed probabilities but they're encoded in ASCII. What is ASCII? Uh, so ASCII is essentially a way of compressing um, the, the uh, quality scores into single digits. Instead of using two digits, we're using one digit. It matters because we're generating millions of these things, so it's just a very simple way of, of converting from, uh, say, 40 uh, into a single character, say, H. And I just want to point out that if you're looking at um, earlier generation Illumina systems, uh, some of the archive data, that the uh, FRED quality scores are ASCII 64 encoded, which was the original Illumina encoding. Um, more recently, uh, I actually don't, I can't remember when the transition occurred. That was a few years ago now. We moved from ASCII 64 to ASCII 33, which is the uh, FASTQ standard. Okay, so now everything as of today and as of a few years ago is, is moved to the uh, ASCII uh, 33 uh, standard. So how do, you, how do you actually interpret it? You need to know what the ASCII encoding is. If it's ASCII 64, for example, we would look up, and, and for example, the letter, say, was H. We would then look on the ASCII table, see where H was. H equals 104. We subtract uh, 64 from that, and that gives us 40, and that's our FRED score. Okay? If it's ASCII 33, then we would want to subtract 33, not 64. And you can figure it out, even if you don't know what it is, you can figure it out pretty easily. Uh, by, by looking up a few of the, um, a, a few of the uh, uh, quality scores, uh, and you can see you know, whether you're in the right range or not. Okay. So um, 
from the QSeq file, the FASTQ file is generated. And this has really become the universal standard. Uh, this was developed uh, at the Sanger Center as a way of encoding um, massively parallel sequencing data in a, in a compact form. And, and so this is the format that you should be aware of, which is essentially uh, four lines. Uh, the first line begins with the at character and then has a sequence name. And that sequence name, as you'll see when we look at FASTQ files, is an incorporation, is a concatenation of the information uh, related to that run. And for example, when we talk about paired end reads, of course, paired end reads generate two FASTQ files, one for read one, one for read two. And the only way that we relate read one and read two to each other is through their name, because the name is the same, but the read number is different. Okay, so that's how we that's how we associate read one and read two together uh, in, in a FASTQ file is through the, the, the naming. Okay, so we begin with the, the unique name, followed by uh, raw sequence letters, shown as here. Uh, then there's a plus character, which sometimes you can have an optional identifier associated with that line, but typically not. Um, and then we have an ASCII uh, quality scores. And for FASTQ files, the ASCII quality score is encoded in base 33, okay? And it's base 33 because 32, I think, is a space, right, which you can't encode. So that's why 33 is used. There's no, no magic to 33. Okay. So, so I've kind of gone through the, the chemistry. This is, this is the output of your ChIP-seq experiment. It's a FASTQ file. So now you've completed your ChIP-seq run or you had someone else run it. You've got your FASTQ files. How do we assess the quality? Of, the resulting of, the, of this resulting file. Of course, we have millions of sequences, and so we need some way of assessing uh, the quality across all of those sequences in, in a standardized way. And so the tool that we'll be talking about um, today is FASTQC, and we'll be talking about that in the practicum uh, uh, after the break. And this really provides uh, a, a set of standardized metrics for assessing the quality and looks at such things as GC content, overrepresented sequences um, within, the, within the data set, quality scores, et cetera. And what the, as, a, as a sort of uh, take home or takeaway, you know, what I'm gonna be showing you uh, as we go through the practum is that biology matters, okay? So it depends on what mark you're IPing, you're gonna see different results in your FASTQ uh, file. And you need to, to understand what it is you're IPing to be able to interpret the, 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 the fast or the, the quality that, that comes out on the fast QC uh, in, in the back end. And, and we'll be going through an example of how to run it uh, and then how to interpret the output for some common marks. Okay, so uh, in the last, I guess, uh, five or 10 minutes here, I'm just gonna very high level overview talk about the remaining levels. But of course, this will be the topic of uh, Misha Blinky's uh, practicum. Uh, uh, in, in, in later in this afternoon. So once we have the fast cues, we convert those fast cues into the next standard, which is the so once, well, once we have those fast cues, we align them to a reference genome and generate what has become the de facto standard for alignment, which is the BAM file, or which is essentially a binary representation of the SAM file, um, which essentially shows where that um, uh, fragment aligns to, to the genome uh, and associated mapping qualities. And then from there, we go to segmentation and transformation, where we're actually trying to model the, the behavior of, that, um, of, that, of the mark that we're, that we're interested in uh, on the genome. And, and Misha will talk about some techniques and tools for that. But I just want to point out that that second step here, the generation of the, the segmentation, is, is, still remains a very active area of, of research. And there are many, 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 many tools out there. The tools that we're going to talk about today are Max2 uh, and Finder. Uh, Finder is a tool that Misha has developed uh, in-house uh, that overcomes some limitations of Max2. Uh, Max2 is probably the tool that most of you uh, who have worked with ChIP-seq data are probably most familiar with, uh, which has some issues, especially as we deal with uh, deeper sequencing data that you probably should be aware, with, aware of and how it calculates uh, background. So at a very simplistic level, how do we actually generate or how do we, um, uh, how do we transform aligned reads into peaks or enriched regions? So very simply, this is how it's done. And this is actually from back in 2007 or 2008, I think. Um, but the principles uh, really haven't changed. And so the way we do this is we, we start with, for example, an aligned read. 
And as I mentioned, many ChIP-seq data sets, even data sets that generate today, are single-end reads. And, and so we take that aligned reads and we extend it computationally um, by the median length of the fragment distribution that went in. So here is a, a molecular biology trace. This is something called an Agilent bi bioanalyzer, but you can think of it as like a gel, uh, which shows a distribution of sizes uh, for that particular uh, fragment. And so we can take that distribution and we can determine what the median length of that distribution is, and then we can computationally extend the read by the median length. And of course, you can think of many reasons why this might not be as accurate uh, as, as it could be, because of course there are many fragments that are smaller and larger, but we can use this median length as an approximation of what the length of that fragment would be. Of course, if we're using paired end reads, then we actually know what both the gray ends, we know what this read is, and we know what this read is, and we don't have to do this so-called extension. We can just use the read boundaries as are defined by the paired end reads to tell us where that fragment, the length of that fragment is, and where it is aligned on the genome. And that has some advantages, uh, as, as Misha will discuss. But once we've had those reads and we've aligned them, we can then cluster them, or we can look at their distribution on the genome. And essentially what we're looking for are read uh, clusters that point towards one another. So here I have reads that are annotated in blue that are moving five prime to three prime, and reads that are red that are moving three prime to five prime, or that are, that are oriented three prime to five prime. So we look for these groups of reads, these clusters of reads, and then by extending their length using the median length, we can generate a representation or a so-called peak of what those reads look, might look like or, or their distribution might look like on the genome. Uh, and so we have these peaks and then we have to come up with a way of determining whether that peak is of significance or not. And uh, again, Misha will be talking about that uh, in, in, in some depth, but essentially how do you know if a peak that you see in your, uh, in your sequence or in your CHIP-seq experiment is a real peak. And of course, this is the, the crux of the bioinformatics problem. Initially, um, the initial uh, tools such as Find Peaks and the original Max use essentially a random distribution. So you take that same set of reads and you randomly redistribute them back onto the genome and you'd see what the maximum peak height would be uh, with that random distribution. And you set that as your threshold. Anything that's above that, uh, you, you would consider to, uh, to be an enriched sequence. Uh, there are other methodologies to do it, and again, Misha will talk about it. Uh, one of the things that's commonly done is sequencing a so-called background molecular library. Uh, this is typically the input material that went into the IP. So this should be representative of the fragments that went into the immunoprecipitation, so-called background or so-called input library. And Max2 uh, has, uh, you can run Max2 in such a mode that it will uh, calculate your enrichment uh, for each bin based on the, uh, uh, the alignment of your uh, library, your IP library, uh, minus the signal for your input. But that has problems too. That has issues too. Yeah? I just wanted to be clear on the IP. Are you saying that the input is absolutely not required then? Or is it that it was recommended, but is it required? <laughs> That's right. So for IHEC, we, we recommend it. Uh, I, think, I think you have to be, um, um, it's, abs it's not required, um, but it is a helpful addition uh, to be able to determine regions that are uh, uh, showing enrichment uh, as a consequence of your, uh, of your library preparation. Okay, so for example, you might find that there's a region of, of the genome that is shearing um, at a higher frequency than, say, the adjacent regions. And so you're going to have overrepresented fragments even in, in, in the I, before you even start the IP of that particular region. Okay? So when you do your IP um, and you, uh, or when you, when you sequence the input, you're going to get a peak at that region simply because that region was, uh, had a higher uh, frequency of shearing or, for example, MNAs digestion than others. So, so you know, there is definitely um, utility in, in sequencing the input. But the flip side of that is... There are regions, if we take just an input library, and you know, Mike Snyder uh, and the ONCODE Consortium actually published a paper on this, you can actually do a pretty good job at predicting open regions of, of chromatin just based on the input library. So when we're looking, for example, regions, say, H3K4 trimethylation that is, that, that is located in open regions of chromatin, and we simply subtract the input library, we're actually downsampling sampling 
where the real signal is, right? So it's not, there's no, it's not black and white, unfortunately. M most, most folks, when we're running max, use the input and will do the subtraction. Um, but I, I think Misha will, will talk about this. Will you, Misha? Misha will talk about some of the complications of that. But input libraries uh, um, are recommended um, uh, for, and in fact, for publications, typically you'll, you'll need to include an input. Although how you process that input and how you use that input in your analysis, I think, is very um, uh, analysis specific and something you need to keep in mind. Okay, so don't just blindly go in and okay, I'm going to subtract all my input. You know, realize that that you know, realize what you're doing. Think about the biology behind why you're getting signal in your input uh, and how that might um, uh, input, uh, how that might uh, change the or at least modify the result. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah. Single end read, yeah. Can be, yeah. So when you uh, talk about the single end, like fifty million square That's right. Million fragments, correct. And then how big fragments? How long do you read? Yeah. So uh, that that that's a mapping issue. So how you know how many unique how many unique positions in the genome can you align at a particular read? And it's to some degree budget driven. I think the data we're going to look at is 36 base pairs, um, but there's no, I mean, the longer the better to some degree, as long as you're not reading all the way through your insert, and then you're just burning reads on your adapter. So if you're reading, you know, if your insert sizes are 200 base pairs and you're doing paired N 150s, a lot of that, you know, all of the, the, the sequences you're going to be generating are essentially adapter, so it's not particularly useful. So think about the average size of your, your insert versus, uh, versus the sequencing length. But I can say that if you're designing a ChIP-seq experiment, I would highly recommend you do paired end reads for both you know, a, a moderate or a minor increase in mappability. You'll get about 2 or 3% uh, percent more, higher in regions of repetitive sequence, uh, but also the ability to model the, 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 app, the fragment size, the, the precise boundaries of that fragment, as opposed to doing uh, you know, a, 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 an essentially computational extension based on the median size. Yeah. Well, I suppose if you read into the adapter and you trimmed your adapter and you knew, the, if you if you read the entire thing, then no, no, you would not. Um, but I, that's typically not done. Um, I, I I suppose you could do it. Yeah. You had a question. Um, I don't know if this is common, but I think that in the sequencing, the first couple of bases have a lower flex score than the rest. So that's essentially the, in in the generation of the clusters. So the 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 uh, the first bases the the intensity is lower, and then the the, the sequencer um, um, or the the algorithm is able to uh, accurately distinguish uh, the position of the clusters. So yeah, you do get a lower you get the first three or four bases will have a lower uh, base quality, and we'll see some examples of that in the fast queue. But that's in, that's not a chip seek thing; that's a sequencing thing. You see that across all sequencers. Uh, and some people trim the first six base pairs, especially, for example, for RNA sequencing when you're using random priming, but that's not the topic of this discussion. So, but yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Any other questions? So if not, I'm going to very briefly talk in the last like three minutes. I know I didn't include this slide, but um, we, can, um, I, I, we can update these uh, slides. But how do we actually assess the chip C quality itself? Um, and so there are a series of metrics that one can look at. And I think, Misha, you're going to be talking a little bit about this as well, I'm assuming. No? <laughs> okay. So I just, I just want to um, show you. So again, this is, a, uh, this is a, an active area of, of, um, of research, is how do we tell whether a particular chip seek library is of good quality or not. And so I just wanted to show you some of the metrics uh, that we calculate or that can be calculated for looking at the quality of an IP. So this, we're looking at a particular mark, this case H3K27 acetylation. Um, this is all available for you guys to go look at. Uh, so each one of these columns represents an individual library, an individual IP. And you can see at the first uh, thing uh, is just essentially the total number of reads. 
um, not particularly useful. Uh, one can look at the percent mapped, and so of course one would expect your percent map to be, you know, in the range of 80% or so uh, for a good IP. If you have IPs that have low percent mapped, you would you should be concerned. Uh, and the threshold used to be 50% or below, but again, it's up to you to make that distinguishing. There isn't, uh, you know, a hard uh, a hard uh, cutoff. You can then look at um, of uh, the number of reads within that population that are uniquely aligned to the genome. Uh, so looking at whether there is uh, a large fraction of repetitive sequences, and for that we use mapping quality, um, which Misha will be talking about in the context of the BAM alignment. So mapping quality is a way which is different from FRED score, but it's a log transform probability that the base is uh, aligned incorrectly. And we can look at, if you have paradan reads, uh, how many are properly mapped, you can look at the percent of duplicates. So how many duplicates do you have in your library? So here, when we're talking about duplicates, we're talking about PCR duplicates. And PCR duplicates are defined by reads that have the, exactly, that have the same start and end position on the genome. Uh, and we typically flag these as PCR artifacts, so, so uh, amplification artifacts. But if you think about it, if we sequence a library deeply enough, then all the reads are going to be duplicated, right? So if we have, if we just keep sequencing our library, we're gonna, we're going to um, eventually sequence every fragment more than once, right? So, so interpretation of the percent duplicate is 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 not again black and white. It depends on the biology of the mark. So in this case, we have a punctate mark that's found in about two or three percent of the genome. We can find H three K twenty seven acetylation. So even at low sequencing depths, we're going to start to see duplicates arise as a consequence of, their, um, uh, uh, of, of the distribution of that mark in the genome and how deeply we sequence. Okay, So you might ask, well, do you collapse duplicates or not? Uh, and again, uh, Misha can, t can talk about this, um, but it would depend on the mark. Typically, we do not collapse duplicates for ChIP-seq uh, data because by doing so, we're actually bringing down uh, the, 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 the signal uh, in regions that are, um, uh, that are highly marked by that, that particular mark. Okay, and then um, finally, we can look at things, and this is a, a metric that we've uh, been developing uh, in, our, in our own center, which is looking at how much of those reads uh, align to regions that we expect that mark to, uh, to, uh, uh, to mark. So for example, for H3K27 acetylation, we take all the ensemble gene promoters, uh, we take around the transcriptional start site, and we ask, if we look at all the reads, what percentage of those reads align back to that um, predicted domain, or what we would, we would predict H3K27, or at least one component of where H3K27 acetylation uh, would, would, uh, would arise. And you can see that typically, you, you know, you get a, a fairly good representation, and that representation is fairly stable across a, a whole bunch of libraries or a whole set of libraries. Again, each one of these represents a single library, but there are outliers. Some libraries that have more reads that are associated, more fractional uh, number of reads that are associated to a promoter region, and some regions that are not. Uh, and I'm not going to, in, in the interest of time, I won't go through the, through all of them. But when you uh, you can look through each of the the marks um, that we that we profiled here, and you can see that different marks have different performances. So, for example, H3K36 trimethylation, where we look within gene bodies, and we ask what fraction of reads align back to gene bodies in our IPs, we get a much stabler performance over time than we do, for example, for H3K27 acetylation. So, how do you measure the quality of an IP? You can look at the mapping qualities, the mapping characteristics, and you can look at where you think that read should align uh, in, in the genome and what fraction of reads align within, within those regions. Okay, so with that, I will end it there. Uh, and I guess it's coffee break time. Uh, question, yeah? So when it comes to the issue about duplicate reads, um, one way potentially to get around that is to include with your PCR primers some random, all the random runs of and if you have a duplicate read that's of the same length in the genome but has different sequences within those uh, additional indices, those would define true distinct reads, would they not? Right. And so that's the technology. So this idea of adding a, another random MERS, we talked about indexes. You can also add another random MERS in your library construction. And that's typically done for read counting exercise, such as RNA-seq and microRNA sequencing. 
Uh, and the reason it's used there is because we, we have a random priming event that allows us to bring that oligo in. When we talk about chip seq libraries, we're not doing a random priming, typically. At least I'm not aware of technologies that do it that way. So you would have to adapt, you'd have to ligate that randomer onto the end of your uh, onto the end of the uh, adapter, which you could do, um, but you'd have to modify the uh, the sequences to allow you to do it. Um, but that would be a way of of distinguishing between uh, true PCR duplicates or or true duplicates and PCR duplicates because uh, true duplicates would have different um, randomers on the end versus PCR duplicates would, which would have the same randomer and the same position. Yeah, so I mean, I think, um, but, you know, typically we do not collapse duplicates for chip seq reads, um, and I think the reasons for that are, are hopefully uh, fairly apparent. We, yeah, oh, Misha's collapsing them. RNA-seq we don't, sorry, chip seq we do, yeah. Okay, any other questions? If not, we'll uh, go to coffee break. Thanks, guys.